Well, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, it's good to see just about all the seats filled, so I guess I got to sit in the front. Um, so this is our actually our first and our last Maple Street Construct Design Lecture Series lecture for 2023. Um, we will have a full lineup of lectures in 2024 with some uh, being hosted here at our space at Maple Street Construct and others at Benson Theater just down the street. Um, currently working out um, the dates and details for those. So we're anticipating having at least four to five lectures next year. Um, for those of you who might not know, Maple Street Construct, we're a creative run arts organization and our mission is to provide free programming to help elevate the creative discourses in our community. Maple Street Construct serves a critical role in the promotion and presentation of art, design, and the built environment by bridging the discourse between outside and local cultural conventions. Um, we are also actively seeking sponsors for the 24 lecture series. So I will be reaching out to several, there are many firms um, and product manufacturers. So um, I just ask that you please respond to my email pitch if it comes your way. Uh, we would greatly appreciate that. You can say no, you can also say yes. Um, I do want to thank AI Nebraska for being a partner with us on this uh, design lecture series and moving forward into 2024, they will um, be our partner with um, as well. And I also want to thank the Nebraska Masonry Alliance tonight for being the food and beverage host. Uh, we can always count on them to bring the booze and the food. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, um, and then lastly, this lecture does qualify for one um, AIU CEU learning credit. So if you are an AI member, uh, what? Oh, if you are an AI member, um, I have a QR code up there and on the back wall um, by the food uh, to scan. That's what Sarah prefers instead of me emailing her a copy of all your names and email addresses and numbers so scan it if you need it um, and with that I'm going to introduce Patrick um, Patrick Ty is the principal and founder of the Los Angeles of Los Angeles based Ty architecture the firm's work has received over 100 design awards including eight national AIA honor awards American architecture awards a progressive architecture award Los Angeles architecture awards uh, Westside Prize, Best of Year Awards, as well as local AI honors. What haven't you guys won? In 2011, Patrick was elevated to the College of Fellows of the AIA. And in, uh, or previously, Patrick was also awarded the prestigious uh, Mercedes T. Uh, Bass Rome Prize in Architecture and the AIA's Young Architect Award. Patrick is also a fellow of the American Academy and the McDowell Colony. Patrick received a Master of Architecture from UCLA, and prior to establishing Thai Architecture, Patrick worked in the offices of Frank Gehry and Tom Main. Patrick is also a professor at the University of Southern California. Uh, Patrick is here for the week with us at Maple Street Construct as an artist in residency. Um, and he, we will be having an exhibition of his work on uh, First Friday here in the space. So he'll, after this, he will go back and start making a lot of work. Um, so we're excited to see what he makes while he's here on his uh, residency. And, um, but tonight, this will kind of be a little bit more architecture focused with drawings and, and the work that he does um, day to day. So. Um, hopefully, we'll see you guys Friday as well. And with that, um, please welcome Patrick. Thank you, Ross. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight in Omaha. I'm very thankful for this opportunity. Uh, thanks to AIA Nebraska, and thanks to uh, the Maple Street gang, uh, Tom, Ross, and Mike. Um, it's really great to be here. As Ross mentioned, um, I'm participating in a residency 
and uh, I'll be uh, producing some work all week and showing the work here um, on Friday. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and what I thought I'd do tonight, this talk, is to try to tie in uh, some of the work we do, not just our buildings, but also our drawings uh, and the models that we make. It's a big part of our practice. So um, I was talking earlier to, um, I forget your name, the woman, the, Susan, in the back. And I was just saying how uh, it kind of informs the work and it helps us um, move the work along and work through some ideas. And um, I'm going to touch on that in the lecture. I'm going to attempt to touch on that in the lecture. So uh, thank you. So um, we look at things and we see things uh, differently. Uh, what if everyone saw the same thing but in a different way? And I, I think I've been you know, grappling with this question for some time now and I realize that uh, the, the way we see things is influenced by the lens from which the, the subject is viewed. So uh, Caravaggio, as you all know, um, his paintings are depict religious themes, but a closer inspection, one sees some things that uh, are very different. Uh, the religious turn sensual, maybe even erotic. So it's these ideas of multiple readings, subtext, double entendre, that they're, really, they're very intriguing. And I think um, that adds like a whole other dimension layer to, to the work. Uh, I always had the, the uh, problem with the color, not a problem. Um, I always thought that I saw green differently than other people. And, and I still think I do, right? There's a test that they have uh, for seeing the color green. And then within the circle, some people see numbers and some people see nothing at all, right? So people do have different interpretations of the same thing. And this is one instance where we can see something or everyone sees something different. Um, so it seems like there's lots of instances out there. Uh, this is just one that we know of, but I think we see things in different ways. Uh, this, this book, John Berger, uh, the way we see things is affected by what we know or what we believe. So it's our past, our conditioning, our environment, the people with whom we surround ourselves. These are all things that um, affect us, right? But definitely affect the work. So for me, it's you know where I came from, uh, people that I work for, literature that I like, art that I like, these are all things that inform us and become part of uh, who we are, what we do. So where do I fit in as an, as an architect? And how do I see our work or how do others see our work? We all know that making architecture is, is, is difficult, complex, rigorous. Um, and it depends on a lot of circumstances and we have all these tools that we use um, but art, in the end, architecture is about finding resolution. It's about solving problems and um, ultimately creating buildings that uh, satisfy all the things that, that drive or influence the project. And uh, sometimes or oftentimes there's obstacles on the way that uh, also influence the project. So I'd like to think in our work that we, we, we strive to um, expand these notions of seeing and to allow for, to allow the user, the habitant, uh, to experience uh, multiple readings. And part of the way this achieved for us, I think, is, is through drawing. Uh, throughout history, drawings have been used as a way to imagine new realities and rethink the world around us. Uh, drawings really are architecture storytellers. Great drawings that inspire us, they move us, and sometimes the drawing even transcends the work. So for us, we use drawings as a way to uh, document the work, uh, to examine the work, to reposition the work, and to reimagine the work. Uh, this week I'm here in Omaha, as I, as I mentioned, doing this uh, residency here at Maple Street. And uh, I'm, I'm really working on expanding this idea and uh, using this as an opportunity to um, further this, this idea of seeing and using uh, drawing as, as, a, as a means to do that. 
So um, as Ross mentioned, I've practiced in LA 20 years now, going strong, and uh, we do um, we do a lot of we have a diverse practice. Uh, we do single family, high end stuff. We do a lot of multifamily. We're pretty active in the affordable housing world in LA. Uh, we're very much interested in uh, looking at new ways of housing people, all types of people. Uh, our practice is uh, very varied, and that's what um, uh, I, I enjoy that very much. And I, I, I'll show kind of a, a range of projects tonight and link them to this idea of drawing. So like many firms, we started doing single family residences and we still do single family residences. Um, in the beginning, this sort of really is a testing ground for, for our practice as is the case for most firms, especially in Southern California. Um, it allowed us to explore certain ideas and um, uh, I'll share with you a few single family residences tonight. Um, we're interested in projects that contribute to the urban environment uh, density is is something that we're really interested in and as I mentioned looking at new ways to house people creating buildings that make a connection with the city uh, buildings that begin to stitch back the urban fabric and the multifamily dwelling uh, is, is a means to, to do that and uh, some of these projects are also affordable um, we, we are our practice is very much interested in um, affordable housing and it's a good part of what we do and then we're also working on projects at a, a larger more urban scale uh, commercial work and public work and then we have a lot of work that's that's tied to the arts so let me start with some single family residences and I'll go through these rather quick. Um, this project is in the Hollywood Hills, hence the name Hollywood Hills House. Um, it's a uh, single family residence built into a, a hillside. It's in the Mulholland Corridor. So the idea is that you couldn't see it from the street. So it had to be strategically placed on the site. Uh, it's about layering and this idea of strata from the site was then taken into the house itself. Um, these are just a series of process models that we underwent to come up with the right scheme. Um, the drawing is used as a way to document the project, um, but also we extend that into um, other avenues. Um, the construction process is, is, is very Im important to the work. Uh, here are the project to see another construction. This model is um, made of steel, and we're, we spend a lot of time making things, drawings, and models. Um, it helps us uh, realize the, the final building. Uh, a view of the interior of the project, um, the exterior project, uh, exterior view of the house. Uh, there's kind of one sinuous move that um, defines the home and again it was really about relating the project to the site uh, the pool is elevated from the hillside the the lowest level is uh, a concrete base the mid level is completely transparent and then the upper level is a series of uh, punched openings as you can see here the entry at the base and then the elevated building on the right. Uh, there's a semi-subterranean artist studio. The piece on the left is the structure that one would uh, use to make their way down into the lower level. Uh, and then there's windows that open up into the pool. And then there's a, uh, the interior uh, is seen on the right. So it's a simple form, um, a simple massing uh, that works mostly with the uh, environment. It's a sustain very sustainable home uh, built to take advantage of the site, built to kind of blend in with the site. And then the drawings are used as a way, in this case for an exhibition, 
to um, evaluate the work. And we use the drawing as a way to kind of, sometimes these drawings were done for an exhibition, but they, they, they not only document the work, but um, document the process and the aspirations. And sometimes the, the drawing takes on its own life. And we like that about the process. Another model of the, of the same uh, home with a construction document overlaid. And then this drawing again talks about all the ideas, aspirations, uh, goals. Sometimes the drawing in the end, we build in things that we might not have achieved with the uh, actual building. And it allows us to um, create um, the uh, elevated project. So I'd like to share another project with you uh, tonight. Um, this, actually this project and the previous project are in the current issue of uh, GA, um, Global Architecture Magazine. This is, uh, we call it Longwood, it's in mid-city LA. It's actually an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit, um, which are, I'm not sure how um, prevalent they are here in Omaha, but they're taking on a new kind of life in, in LA. Uh, where we have an extreme housing crisis, but um, the city allows people to build a secondary dwelling on their property. And this property is unique in that it's mid-city LA, so it's right in the midi middle of the city, but there's a tributar tributary of the LA River that runs through the site. So the main house is situated here, and then ba and the back portion of the lot on the other side of the creek uh, is the ADU which is a guest house, a pool house. So it's a very simple form um, with a lot of structure. Uh, we have this large overhang for the, for the building that allows for sun protection. Uh, the client wanted to have a swimmer's pool but didn't want to be in the sun. Um, so we came up with a design that gave him this great indoor, outdoor uh, condition, which we you know, can exploit in Southern California. Uh, and again, the drawing that shows the process and the means of construction and the structure uh, all kind of combined uh, to create this vignette. So this view looks out uh, over the pool, obviously. Uh, the main house you can see in the distance, the primary residence is in the distance. And then the diagram just shows how the massing works with the large overhang. And then the oculus uh, penetrates the roof plane that allows for um, some desirable sun conditions throughout the day. So it's not just about shade and shadow, but it's also this interplay of light and the, the way that the mass uh, is both heavy and uh, light. The video shows the piece in context. And literally, this is mid-city LA. So it really feels um, isolated, but it's very much part of the city in another way. But it really is uh, kind of an oasis on this amazing um, property. The structure is, uh, well, it's, it's a, there's a, a moment frame and then these uh, V columns uh, allow for the roof to uh, touch the ground. Uh, this, this is just a detail of the sauna that's inside and the custom mosaic that we did uh, in the sauna. Detail of the oculus and again the drawing composite uh, that shows process, construction, the actual piece all co collaged together uh, to give us a new reading and uh, kind of document uh, the history of the project. 
uh, 900 Tiger Tail. Uh, this is an interesting project. Uh, the per peculiar form really is a result of uh, many of the conditions inherent within the site that include setbacks and height restrictions and view orientations, uh, all kind of informed the building. This is in Brentwood, California, and the area is called Crestwood Hills. Crestwood Hills is a was a planned community. Is a planned community. It was planned in the 50s uh, by the likes of A. Quincy Jones and others. Uh, it's a collection of mid-century homes, and this this is actually a remodel. The homes you see on the right uh, was a mid-century home in disrepair. Uh, the client wanted to tear it down, and we convinced him to keep the project, uh, keep the building and to uh, work with uh, the existing. The front of the house is modest in scale and uh, the building is protected. It's private at the street. Structurally, there are three bent steel moment frames that straddle the existing building that, that create the second story. And then the folded geometry that defines the building is uh, seen as an extension of the topography. Plan is an open plan, 3,500 square feet. Uh, and again, you can see a lot of this is the existing plan kind of reconfigured, uh, but the house is very well situated to open up to the views. Uh, the simple entry on the left. Composite plan and uh, presentation model. Simple uh, exhibition model that we made. And then this shows the back of the house uh, framing the view of the Getty Center in the distance. And then a series of drawings, again, that document the work. Um, similar to previous projects, it's partially built work under construction, construction drawings, diagrams, uh, collage together uh, to give the project uh, a new reading, a new life. This is a project we just finished in Santa Barbara. We call it Firehouse because the house was previously burnt. Um, it's in the area called the Riviera, which is kind of high up in the hills in Santa Barbara, uh, overlooking the, the bay. You can see here on the left. It's a very simple home. We had to keep the footprint of the original home. The client asked that we uh, create a fire resistant home. So the house is made of steel, concrete, and glass. And it's pretty modest. Um, one story, it's actually a second story, is it on the downside slope of the house, but it's a relatively modest home. Um, we were influenced by the likes of uh, mid century LA architects, the case study homes, so it's uh, very much in that vein. Uh, the section shows how there's an ADU that we built in underneath the house. The interior, you can see the, the, the structure is a series of steel wide flange, they're almost like eyes, not W, sections, uh, and there's corrugated metal above that, concrete floor and glass. And then we wanted to leave all of that exposed, so the fireplace is defined, and there's a piece of a lid that defines, the ceiling that defines the living room, uh, but then the rest of the ceiling scape or roofscape is exposed. <clears throat> the entry canopy, um, we have a series of these very slender uh, X columns that was borrowed from various mid-century architects, or Kabu, I guess, originally. But this idea of this kind of light canopy that, that draws you in and um, allows you to enter the home. And then the house is very transparent. At the front side, there's uh, a swimmer's pool. And then the back drops off to the hillside and opens up uh, to the view. So it's very much this idea of indoor-outdoor, uh, which is easy to do uh, in Southern California, in Santa Barbara. Very simple home. And the drawing uh, that we did to um, document the home. Uh, I think I have one more house to show. Monte Carp House in, in Malibu. Uh, 
this is an existing home as well. Uh, the clients wanted, after living in this home for 20 years, they wanted something completely different. Um, so we gave them uh, a home that was very much not like their original home that was very kind of chalet-like with dark, small rooms. Um, and this was a fun project to work on. The models show the, uh, the configuration of the home. The plan is essentially uh, an open plan. Uh, the open plan of 2,800 square feet, there's a forced perspective that opens up to the ocean that also happens in the section. So the angle uh, informs both the plan and the section. <clears throat> Much of the home was designed with the uh, client's art collection in mind. Um, so lots of uh, niches and places for art become the focal point in many of the rooms. And then the detailing, uh, furniture placement, et cetera, was pretty much all dictated by uh, the display of, of art in the home. There's a steel stair that can weave out from the wall. It has a custom laser pattern cut into the steel treads. And then uh, we designed a skylight above it so that the light filters through the perforated stair and projects this ever-changing texture of shadow and light on both the, the floor and the walls. We designed this uh, grand entry door that met, marks a threshold into the relatively small uh, house. The geometry of the opening is a result of the surrounded faceted volumes. So the, the door itself is made of a two-inch stainless steel tube frame. The door is 10 foot high and six foot wide. Uh, and it has a hydraulic pivot uh, concealed with a, a, a magnetic locking device. So there's two layers. There's the the glass pivot door, and then there's a sliding screen of steel on the inside. The steel of screen on the inside is similar to the perforation in the steel stairs. So the project has an outward focus. Uh, here are seen in the dining room, overlooking uh, the cliffs with the walls of glass, uh, but also an inward focus is seen in the kitchen uh, in this composition of white. Master bedroom consists of a palette of grays that were chosen to complement the eucalyptus tree, which you can see outside the bedroom window. A sculpted vanity for the powder room is made of Corian, all integrated. Um, the piece itself is made with a similar strategy as the house. The faceted volume extends out towards the ocean, uh, penetrating the building and framing the view of the sea. So the building is uh, abstract, yet it's very functional. Uh, it's unexpected, and um, but most of the moves are pretty rational, actually. So the house is designed from the inside out. Here, this long horizontal window in the study frames the view of the Santa Monica Mountains. This is obviously the not the ocean side, but the Santa Monica Mountains side. And then that massing shows up uh, in the exterior as well. And to end with the drawing, the composite drawing uh, that talks about the ideas of the project in a composition. Moving on to multifamily projects. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we're, we're very much interested in density and looking at new ways of housing people. This is a dense project right outside um, downtown LA. I call it Court Apartments. It's 80 units. Uh, there's a peculiar plan done for a number of reasons, but the circulation corridor bisects the building on the diagonal, leaving us these two outdoor spaces on either end of the square for uh, one's a terrace for a pool, and the other is a terrace for um, the residents. And sometimes we, we call this the wedge because it has this void that uh, tapers in section that allows light into the building, into the common spaces of the building. Um, and you can see it on the left in relationship uh, to downtown LA.
so it's a relatively inexpensive project. Um, we, we do have this uh, screen that's pulled away from the building that works off of the, the balconies for the units, uh, clad with uh, various uh, metals, corrugated metal, both solid and perforated, uh, and some vertical elements uh, that create uh, a lighting uh, scheme at night. Presentation model on the right, and uh, the building is seen from above on the left. Uh, we just finished this project we call Barranca. It's an area of LA called Lincoln Heights. It's um, it's the Lincoln, uh, it's it's the uh, Cornfield Arroyo specific plan. So it's this, air, this new designated area of LA uh, that's an industrial area rezoned. Uh, city is. Um, supporting or they want to encourage uh, housing so uh, uh, developers like it because there's an increased uh, density less dependence on the automobile uh, this project is 200 units so we're playing with this idea of um, uh, the arcade and the arch and use that as a way to to break down the fenestration at the street And the, the building is pretty rational and ordered, as a lot of these uh, housing projects need to be. So we try to put some energy into um, the areas where uh, one would experience it the most, at, at the street, uh, and make a connection uh, with the neighborhood. The model of the project, and uh, it's almost like different uh, pieces are treated differently to break up the massing and the scale and the experience of this project. The plan on the left shows the dense configuration of the units. A lot of these are um, micro units, and but there's also one and two beds. So the idea is that it was uh, affordable. Uh, this isn't a 100% affordable project, but uh, the the units are affordable in the sense that uh, there's different types that accommodate different uh, levels of um, interest and uh, cost. And then the massing, as you can see, pretty dense. The arcade on the right, uh, again, a pretty low budget project, but we wanted a little punch with the arches so we create we use the mosaic uh, to uh, accentuate the depth the thickness of the arch and to give it a little splash of um, color and then the drawing that shows um, the density and the layering of the different ideas all embedded in the in the work Project in Santa Monica, 50 units. Uh, mar this is market rate. It's not affordable. Uh, it's a low density project. This is what's allowed in the area. They've since changed the zoning, so you can go higher. But uh, we just finished this, and two years ago, you were only allowed uh, three stories. So it seems uh, rather generous compared to uh, other housing projects. It's a corner uh, lot. It's very straightforward building. Um, the uh, I guess that we played with the fenestration with these, uh, this idea of these splayed columns uh, at the base and the drawing that talks about the ideas behind the project. 2300 Beverly in LA, 50 units, um, again a very uh, affordable uh, market rate project. Pretty dense um, project where the units are configured around a courtyard. Uh, that opens up to the city views. Uh, in this project, we put some effort into celebrating this corner piece that is the most prominent uh, area of the project or visible. Relatively simple, straightforward elevation uh, that culminates with this interest at the corner. We do a lot of co-living projects. Co-living's co-living is kind of a, a popular uh, form of housing now in, in Los Angeles anyway, where um, 
residents can share their apartment with other people that they don't know necessarily. It's almost like a dorm situation where you have a bedroom and a bathroom, but you share a living room uh, with other roommates essentially. Uh, and then the, the building has other shared amenities that the whole building has uh, to use. So they come fully furnished and the idea is that these people, a lot of people live there for a year and move on kind of thing. Um, so this one's Mid-City LA. It's five townhomes, each with six bedrooms. So it's like 30 suites. And then the common areas are the, the courtyard, which is central to the townhomes. Uh, and then there's other areas for communal spaces for shared cooking and movie night, etc. So we're actually doing a lot of these co-living projects now. Th this is a relatively smaller one, but we're doing much larger ones. Um, <clears throat> it seems like developers are, are making these uh, pencil out, so it seems to, uh, the numbers work. Whereas these days, a lot, uh, it's harder to, um, I guess, finance these projects, but the co-living seems to still work. relatively simple project, simple building forms. Um, and then construction-wise, the parking is at the base. The, the townhomes are elevated on the concrete plinth. Uh, type five construction, obviously, over the concrete floor. So as I mentioned, um, we do a lot of work in the affordable housing sector. These are two affordable housing projects that we did uh, several years back that have um, gained us a lot of um, recognition. Um, Sierra Benita on the left and La Brea on the right. These are both in uh, West Hollywood, actually. Um, similar in that they're both for a nonprofit developer. Uh, one's for people living with disabilities. The other is for formerly homeless LGBTQ youth. Um, they're both four or five stories, both type five over concrete podium, so very similar. Uh, and we do a lot of these. Um, I won't go into these in too much detail because they're older projects now, but I will emphasize um, or talk about the drawings that we did um, to document the work. So this is for our La Brea project. And again, the, the, the drawing on the bottom was really about fabricating these uh, ribbons that made up this corner piece for the project, uh, the presentation model on the right, obviously. Uh, and then a series of composite drawings that just talk about the ideas um, behind these affordable housing projects. So we, we really you know think of affordable housing as, as an opportunity to create a special architecture. Um, it's really more special than other buildings and um, it's important, for this one, it was important to kind of reevaluate like what people thought about affordable housing. So these ideas of, um, in this case, the, the movement of the ribbons and how they were fabricated in these drawings um, capture some of that, the courtyard, looking up into this uh, corner space that is, uh, it's not just circulation space, but it's open space for the residents. Pieces of fragmentation, pieces of the fabrication drawings overlaid onto the built piece. The central garden, the physical model. Uh, this is a 100% affordable housing project that we just finished. This project is uh, net zero, lead platinum. It's 30 says, 37 residences in Santa Monica, several blocks from the beach. Um, it was built on the site of a former gas station. And like the previous two that I showed you, it's for a nonprofit. <clears throat> so this was a great project. Um, Conceptually, we the form is we took the the idea of a like like a, a home as one would know it, and we kind of reevaluated that form, broke it down, uh, abstracted that form to create um, the 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 new architecture. And you can see from the site plan, we're just close, just uh, south of downtown Santa Monica, and right close to uh, the 10 freeway and to the ocean. Building's built around a courtyard and it's a relatively simple building.
in this case we um, the buildings mostly plaster but parts are, are wrapped with corrugated and then this uh, corner belly piece we came up with a, um, a custom shingle that we created we actually made it in our own shop we wanted a splash of color and texture uh, at this very important uh, corner and then we meet, we make these cuts through the building to create a, a porous, uh, more porous condition in the massing that allows for the ocean breezes to pass through, and there's opportunities for landscaping. And the build, the building is not completely done, uh, but there will be, there is a cafe that's going in right here, a small coffee shop. So I can't wait to activate that void with. Um, some activity, which is hopefully will happen really soon. Uh, the presentation model that we spend way too much time making. It's a section model, so it's half the building. Uh, and that's the, the final pro the model on your right and the detail of the building on the left, obviously. Courtyard. There's actually a small playground for the children, for children in the in the playground, which is a which was a requirement of one of the lenders. These these projects are difficult in that we have lots of different. The money's coming from lots of different sources, and there's lots of different requirements of, of the lenders. So it's a bit of a puzzle sometimes. Uh, there's a terrace on the fourth floor that overlooks looks the city. You can see the Santa Monica Mountains in the distance. <clears throat> and the back side of the building is, is relatively simple, um, where the terraces are clad with perforated metal. And the building at night. Drawing, of course. And another collage-like unfolded elevation layered on top of plans and sections and collage. So we did a project um, a while back, uh, an installation uh, in LA at a school called SciArc where I, where I used to work. And um, this is, I'm not showing the project, I won't get into too much detail, but I do want to talk about the drawings. So um, this was uh, an installation in the gallery and we constructed this piece out of foam. So we, we sprayed, we used spray foam. We made, we made a form, we sprayed it with, with spray foam, multiple layers of um, open and closed uh, cell foam uh, to create this self-structural parabolic form. And then we carved out the interior with robots. So this is the piece on the left in the gallery. And you went through this dark hallway chamber, and then you entered into this um, space that was the um, installation. This is the interior of it. So part of it was like letting the robots do their thing for a week, and the students were able to go in and watch the production of, of the um, installation for a week. And then at the end, uh, this was the kind of the final product. But the installation wasn't just about the final product, it was also about kind of building it and experimenting uh, with this material, foam, both structurally, acoustically. Uh, I work with, a, in this case, a composer, and we pumped in sound to the thing as well that was linked to the lights that you see embedded in the foam. So it was really this experiential kind of thing, and it was a lot of fun. And these were the drawings. So th this drawing talks about the positioning of the robot in the space and the plan, and then the old, and then the um, unfolded partial elevation. And then also this um, behind it is uh, a diagram of, of the sound um, uh, view, kind of a worm's eye view of the topo, the topography of the space, a series of sections. Um, or a section, and then these pieces on the right are these uh, pieces, of these voids that each one had a speaker. Um, these were vacuum formed out of foam, these openings, and they, they kind of allowed the sound to pulsate through the space. Uh, 
uh, elevation and a, a view, sectional view, uh, a section and a plant. And then you can see the, the positioning of the robot in the space. Uh, and I just show these again to, to kind of relate the idea of drawing, the process of drawing, as a way to um, build a project, but also uh, to communicate uh, ideas. Uh, this drawing shows the tool path of the robot. I think there were, there were eight different tool paths. You can see the diagram of them on the bottom. And then each one kind of um, unrolled in 3D space and collaged on top of each other. And what the drawing does is it allows a project to kind of take on a new life um, or maybe be reimagined or reused. Uh, this project was seen by um, a fashion designer, Rick Owens, and he wanted us to do uh, some of his boutiques using a, a similar strategy. So uh, this was a space that was um, a continuation or a new version of the Cyark installation. This is a boutique in London in Selfridges um, for fashion designer Rick Owens. Selfridges department store is a, is a huge, um, huge store it, with like almost like little stores within it, like a lot of department stores have. So this was a, just a small space within a much larger um, department store and we were very much interested or he was interested in uh, this idea of the articulated surface and it, it needed to be um, a, a backdrop obviously uh, because the the product uh, it was the most important thing so there's a lot of detail here but it, it's also um, subtle enough I guess is the word or um, it needed to it needed to be a backdrop and not stand out too much. So um, the sketches just show this idea of like uh, trying to work this this kind of thickness of the poche and plan and section uh, so that we could make it work within this space in the store and then fabricate this piece offsite obviously bring it in and uh, put it all together. So uh, we were interested in this idea of the raw and, and the tactile and obviously we were able to kind of use the various tools at our disposal to exploit some of those ideas and to um, really kind of interrogate this idea of like thickness and poche and milling to uh, you know create uh, these surface treatments that would ultimately become uh, the panels uh, for the boutique. Okay, uh, 8500, this is in uh, West Hollywood, corner of Melrose and La Cienega, which are two major thoroughfares in the city. Almost like It's almost like the gateway into the city. Um, this is actually a, a renovation. A lot of our projects are renovations. I'm, I'm just realizing this now. Uh, but it was an existing building that was once dubbed, you can see here, the ugliest building in. Uh, it was clad with this kind of uh, granite. Actually, in the 80s, in Pomo, I think it was actually probably a pretty cool building then. Uh, it was actually in some movies. Um, but it was mostly about um, the owner wanting to um, get better tenants because it was so closed. They weren't really t they weren't really able to get the clientele that they wanted or the retailers that they wanted. So they came to us. They said, oh, "We want to reimagine this building. We want to be more open and transparent to make a strong connection with the street." Um, so that's what we did. So we we oh and we couldn't add any square footage to the, to the building. So we did add in some instances. We brought the building out. But then we had to push the building back. So it was this kind of uh, play uh, in plan and in section on how we could manipulate the building uh, to bring it to the street a little bit, to open it up as much as possible, and to make the thing uh, transparent. So here's the, um, the final version um, of the project. And now it's, it's uh, obviously fully occupied, and they do have great tenants. Uh, but this is when it was first completed. And it's really about this corner piece and how the, the roof kind of engages the corner and uh, 
comes out a little bit, so uh, it's visible from multiple angles, and it's this dynamic form that wraps this kind of uh, transparent uh, glass volume. So a simple project, but a fun project, and um, it's occupied by uh, the Real Real, which is a high-end consignment. I'm not sure if they're here in Omaha, but they made it their kind of uh, headquarters. So um, I like that. The model, the drawing, of course, section model, and yet another drawing. Uh, Dark Beach Park is a public park for the city of Santa Monica. It's a one acre park on the beach. It's really a landform or piece of landscape. Um, it's a series of uh, earth berms that define these uh, play areas or playgrounds for, for kids of different ages. And um, it's a Universally accessible playground, so it's for children of all abilities, people of all abilities, uh, but that was a big part of uh, the park. And uh, again, it needed to be, or we wanted it to be very much about um, the landscape, so we created these dunes that were reminiscent of the sand dunes that were once there, and they're planted with grasses. And then two distinct play zones, actually three play areas for uh, kids of different ages. And then there's a series of shade structures that we've designed um, that give some shelter uh, for the kids throughout the day. Then the whole thing of these berms are uh, made of rubber. So there's uh, lots of uh, opportunities for, for play both um, built in and imaginative. And then the paths uh, go up eight feet. So when you get to the top, you get a better view of the ocean and mountains, and then they define uh, the play areas as well. A series of images that talk about the construction. So the models. More models, uh, the model and the park. So on one side is the, are the bluffs of Santa Monica, downtown Santa Monica is right behind that, uh, and obviously the ocean on the ocean side. And it really is about this section um, that gives the park its uh, life. And it, parts of it are exposed, parts of it are protected and safe. Um, so there's really all these different kinds of experiences and um, different places within the park, which we like. And a different kind of drawing, uh, in this case, section model on the right, and then one of the shade structures on the section model on the left, and a shade structure on the right. And we wanted these, uh, obviously they're, they're very heavy, made of steel, but we wanted them to um, feel really light. Um, so we used a series of columns that uh, come in and they have a small footprint uh, within the landscape. And then each of these have a heavy uh, caisson or two that go uh, deep down into the ground. So it's really a fun project. Uh, we were able to get a little bit of architecture with the straight structure, shade structures, but it really is about um, the landscape and designing a uh, fun place for kids. Uh, this is a this, this part is called a sensory garden. So this is this is for uh, children that might not be able to use other parts of the park. Uh, so there's various, there's a sound column, abacus, and certain things that would uh, appeal to uh, certain kids.
that might have um, other challenges. And the bike path uh, runs by the park. And the section that shows how the building works with the elevated <coughs> berm. Now a bit with a drawing that shows uh, section of the model so of the uh, confines of the uh, context of the model and drawing together for the for exhibition. Uh, this project we call, I'll send it here with, um, we call La Apertura. It's uh, seven windows. We did this for the Venice Biennale. So um, these actually, these windows, we had made similar ones for the Psyarch installation here, kind of rethought in a different way. Actually, we used the forms that we vacuum formed, the, the openings for the Psyarch installation. And here we made release out of them. We call it seven windows uh, for Venice. Uh, it was displayed at the Venice Biennale, um, and the idea was that they there were these kind of windows, and within the window there was another drawing that was etched in aluminum. So there was this idea of um, like a, a layering of drawings, but in the drawing was a you would get the reflection of yourself looking into the thing. So it was this idea of um, seeing and seeing a, a, a new way of seeing the drawing, both three-dimensionally, two-dimensionally, uh, bring, bring, being brought back into uh, three dimension. Then we had a poem kind of that went with each one uh, that, that was part of the installation. And the idea is that you really got in to, to look at the thing because it was a very different experience than just seeing it from, from afar. So uh, Kierkegaard said, uh, life is not a problem to be solved, but rather a reality to be experienced. And we all know architecture is very much about solving problems, uh, but done well, it's also very much about uh, creating that reality and experiencing that reality. And um, I think that's what we're interested in. And uh, I think through this act of drawing, uh, we were allowed to um, exploit that and to um, help, it helps with our, with our process. So um, that was the kind of point I was trying to make tonight. And thanks for indulging me. Thank you. Uh, we do, yeah, if people have questions, go ahead and ask Patrick. Patrick, I have a question. Fabulous presentation, so uh, mind opening, but I have a question particularly about affordable housing, market rate housing, and co, co living. When you, your, your drawing certainly were inspirational and anybody that had already bought into the concept would say, okay, this is what we meant. Were those always done for developers or nonprofits who had already decided they were gonna do it and they just happened to be forward looking enough to hire your firm or were you somehow like on spec and you were competing against three other firms. How did that work? Because the work for those those oftentimes boring, terrible designs that are so important, but the way you have designed them is so inspirational. Well, thank you for that. Um, we, we, I, there's a lot of affordable housing projects that, that I didn't show you, um, but I did show you more. Kind of, the ones that won. <laughs> well, the ones well, that got built. <laughs> well, no, we have we have we have a lot built, but the, the the ones I show you are probably more celebrated. Or um, we, you know, for these projects, they first and foremost they, they need to be practical. Mm -hmm. They need to come in on budget um, because if they don't, then we're in trouble, right? So we, we look for ways to create uh, moments mm -hmm. with these projects 
to elevate them. Um, you know, with the first two that I showed, um, we, we really wanted to kind of reevaluate the people, the way people see public housing, uh, because oftentimes it, it gets a bad rap, you know, as well as not in my backyard kind of thing. But um, as we all know, it's important and it's very much needed, and it doesn't have to be this prior in the community. Uh, in fact, you know, in, in LA, we, we have lots, in, not just LA, but um, we, we do pride ourselves in having a lot of great affordable housing projects. So I'm lucky enough to be, I think, part of a group um, that you know, people go to because they maybe want something a little bit more special. And um, we try our best to, to do that. And not, not every affordable housing project you can do it because especially with you know the economy and everything, it's really hard. Right. Yeah. So you choose your battles and um, you try to you try to strive for these moments to elevate the work so that they be, that they can become special. And it is important that they become as special as the stuff we do for uh, super rich people. Homes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. After you do an affordable housing project, how do you um, see that it's used in a manner that you've envisioned so that people can enjoy it? We've had some things in over the last 50 years here in Omaha where the architect had really true vision of privacy in a, in a you know, multifamily, um, multiple different units for different types of people, but after it was constructed, it didn't work the way the architect or the community uh, had envisioned, and it was a big failure, finally. So how do you cross that chasm? Well, you know, I think that's part of the reason how it gets a bad rap is because there have been uh, historically, some projects that were complete failures, right? Like you look at some of these projects that were you know, demolished because of um, uh, poor design or poor siting, maybe poor management. Um, luckily, we work with groups, nonprofit groups that really know this stuff, and they they've done you know all kinds of research, and they have uh, uh, a history of building upon their previous projects so they, they kind of know what works and they give us the program and you know, we kind of take it from there. So we rely on them to, to give us the program that they know will work. So we're not we're not coming we're not reinventing the program. Um, they're telling us the unit mix, they're telling us the amenities, they're telling us like everything that they need to to meet their needs, to meet their pro forma, to meet all the needs of the lenders. So we're not, re we're not reinventing the wheel when it comes to housing. Um, and now we've done so many of them, we, we kind of know it works too. And, and we, we've been building on our past experiences. So I feel like you know, they're, they're getting better and better. And you know, I have a close group of like, we're all close, I'm sure this architectural community is close. In LA, the people who do affordable, we're all friends and we all know what everyone's doing. Um, so we also feed off of each other, and that helps too. So ultimately, that, uh, that failure that you mentioned, um, you know, that, that would be the worst thing, right? We don't want that to happen. And if the project's designed well enough, and you have all the input that you need from the community and the clients, and uh, then there's, there, that's not going to happen in our projects. Patrick, how, uh, can you speak a little bit about your firm? How big is your firm? How many people? Um, disciplines? What kind of, hey, you guys only practice in Southern California? Just a little, you know. Sure, well, uh, we are based in LA, in the city of LA, uh, and there's 50 people in the firm right now. Uh, we just cut back a little bit a lot, a, with the, kind of the climate. We, we do a lot of multifamily, with the multifamily climate, a lot of projects that we were getting out or have been out developers are holding off for a year to get their financing, so that's happening. Um, so it's 15 of us, um, been around for 
for 20 years. I'm, I'm actually from the East Coast, so I do have ties back there. We do projects back east as well as in Southern California, and we do projects internationally. The bulk of our work, however, uh, is in Southern California. Well, thanks, Patrick. I don't know if anybody has any one final question or anything, but if not, um, thank you so much. This is great. And looking forward to what you're doing, you know, the exhibition on Friday, I'm sure it'll be a lot different than <laughs> architecture. Um, but please, uh, everyone stop by uh, for First Friday. We'll be open and uh, Patrick will have work up. The space will be filled. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you.